friends. Uh, good morning wherever you might be finding yourselves this morning. We're um, one more week into our lockdown, one more week into winter, one more week into uh, um, the possibilities of, of going uh, stage uh, less as it is and coming back to some sort of normal. Uh, one more week and uh, one more week later I I don't know how you're feeling, but it's been a tough week. It's been a hard week for me. Uh, it's been a hard week in, in so many ways. I just, uh, um, I don't know, my spirit is troubled. My heart, my heart is troubled. My spirit is troubled. My mind is troubled. It's been a tough week. And so thank you for your prayers. I know lots of you are praying for me, and I thank you, and I value that. And please know that I am praying for you as well in this time. We're going to go into a time today of, of being churches as, as, as best as we can um, and as normal as we can. You know, so I've been so, so wrapped up in, in, in not, not, not wrapped up, but I've been so aware that, that we're trying to do church differently because we're online and we kind of miss some of our moments. And this morning, we're going to kind of go back to a, a, a normal sort of style of service. In other words, I'm going to be preaching for about 45 minutes and the worship team is going to lead us in song for about an hour and a half. No, no, no. So what, what are we going to do this morning now? And I just... I want to be real, and you know, one of the things that, that strikes me and, and strikes me, and um, I'm so so aware of this is there's so many churches that got this. Um, we're going live on Sunday morning. We do now live stream. Join us for live, but they've been pre-recorded in the week, and I'm going, yeah, that's great. Um, I really get that. That's great, but that's not live. Live is when you stand up and you preach the word of God, and it goes out, and you trust in and reliant for me deeply on where the Spirit leads that which you've been preparing. So I just want to say to my colleagues, guys, step it up a bit, man. Get there, be real, be with your people on a Sunday morning. Don't you shouldn't be lying in bed. You should be the one just leading from the from from the front. And uh, I just want to just want to say that and put that out there. Anyway, um, so so this morning we're going to be normal. We're going to worship a bit. We're going to pray. We're going to worship. We're also going to have a time of offering this morning. We're going to have a time where we go from worship into our offering space because offering is a place of worship, and we're going to allow ourselves to be to be challenged by that, to be challenged by what it means in this time, in in this uh, in this. Uh, um, crisis, pandemic, with everything that's going on in our lives, the, the struggles, the blessings, the, the breakthroughs, and, 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 and all the questions that many of us are asking, and, 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 and the fears that we've got, we've got to trust God, and, and I want to pray, and I'm going to invite you, that in that offering space, that you, that you allow yourself to just close your eyes. Close your eyes and, and allow God to lead you, allow God to speak to you, allow God to, to whisper into your spirit that, that He's in charge and that He's going to provide. Or if you've, if you've been blessed through this, how can you um, give more or bless more? Where should just allow yourselves to be drawn into the heart of worship in that offering space? Just, just, there's just so much that we, that we kind of don't do or we shouldn't touch on, but, but church. The gift of life, the gift of worship is our song, it's our praise, it's our offering, it's, it's the fullness of who we are. And so I want to pray this morning, we're going to go into a time of song, a time of offering, and then we're going to hear God's word and be challenged, I pray, this morning by what God has got to say. So I invite you to join me as we just go into a time of prayer this morning. Father, we just pray this morning that wherever people are gathering, wherever your church is gathering, Father, this morning, in the different homes, the different locations, the different um, situations, uh, um, Lord, from, from those that are very comfortable to those that are gathering around uh, um, a small little cell phone or um, a tablet, Lord, where, where they've got five or six or ten or perhaps even more people trying to just hear a word, Lord, not necessarily from, from this stream, but from, from wherever the word has been preached and taught this morning, Jesus. We just pray this morning, Father God, that you would step into our midst, step into the space, step into our homes, step into our lounges and our bedrooms, step into our gardens, step in, Father, and may your Holy Spirit just come Come alive, come alive, come alive inside of us once again, Lord. We give you the glory, we give you the honor, we give you the praise that your name deserves and you are worthy to receive that from us, and Lord. So as we go into a time of song, we just we just sing out together, Lord. We sing out in our streets, we sing out in our complexes, we sing out, Lord, wherever we find ourselves. And may we raise a new hallelujah. May we raise a, a voice and a shout of praise to our God, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the great 
I am. He is the great I am and He is the way maker, the promise keeper and the miracle worker. And so Lord bless us as we go into a time of song together this morning. In the precious and the mighty name of Jesus, we sing together.
tells us that Jesus taught us to pray and he taught us to pray in a way that brings us to a place of humility in a place of brokenness but a place of joy in a place of power in the gospel of Matthew Matthew writes these amazing words our father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven Give us today our daily bread, 
Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Matthew goes on to write a, a bit later in Matthew 25. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Our offering is a space of worship as we acknowledge who God is and how he has blessed us, but also this morning perhaps where we find ourselves in deep need. May we allow the words of music and song to minister to us in our time as God speaks into our hearts. this morning we thank you that for those of us who have been able to give you have provided Jesus we thank you that some of us are in a space where we are still receiving salary where we are still getting income in and other things in that we are able to just in turn give to your kingdom and to your church and we thank you for that but Lord in the space of lockdown we are so aware that there are families who are not receiving there are families who are struggling just to to feed themselves and Jesus in that space we bring them before you as well we pray that you would just bless them that you would just be able to offer up whatever it is they need that they would really trust you for their daily bread we know that you will give it but Lord we thank you for everybody who has been able to give today we thank you for the offerings that have come in during the week at the office as well Lord we pray that you would bless them you would multiply them and that you would use them as we seek your face and as we seek to do your will for what you want to do in this time, the plans that you have for our church at the moment. We thank you for this, Jesus, and we pray this in your precious name. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you um, to our worship team, to Cindy and Jason and uh, Anthony and Simone this morning for their, their contribution. Thank you, Lord. And we're just going to say the benediction and uh, we're going to close off with a cup of coffee together. Wouldn't that be awesome that we could just meet afterwards and just uh, just gather? I mean, wonder, I wonder what we're going to do when we're back in church. 
I wonder what we're going to do when we when we have this opportunity to gather again. And I, and I think we, we're going to be we're going to be in a space of struggle. I don't think it's going to go back to the way. And I, I know that for me, what God has said straight away to my heart in in the midst of these last two months is that it's just been so very clear. You know, when you hear clearly from God, um, you just hear, and then it's just it's just been the simple the simple expression. Jeff is God's been saying when we gather again, we're going to gather as one. We're going to gather as one family with one voice with one shout, with one hallelujah, with the oneness that's going to take our, our community by storm. Because all of a sudden, that which was which is multiplied and, 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 and split in a sense, we're going to be one and we're going to be powerful, we're going to be awesome and we're going to love and we're just going to make a huge difference. Amen? Into the context of where we find ourselves as a church and as a ministry, as a people of God. This morning, um, I want to just carry on. Over the last few weeks, I've been, been led to focus in on the disciples and some of the well-known and some of the lesser-known disciples. I, I was challenged to speak a little bit into women over this last week and that was just an awesome space. It was a real challenging space. You know, as we get we get into comfort zones of our preaching spaces when, when, we, when we preach, uh, you know, week in or week out and we have our certain pet, uh, you know, our pet hobby horses and, uh, you know, that's where we love to go and it sometimes it's a good space to challenge and I was just so blessed and challenged by the fact that God didn't just take me to women um, but he took me to the women who were, who were sort of the lesser women of scripture, the ones that, that don't just pop out at you and the ones with no names and the ones that had been through the real real issues. Uh, there, there, was a, there was a woman I wanted, to, I wanted to speak about and I never got there. Um, and there, there's, two, there's two, and I think I'm going to get this right, there's two women in the Bible where, where God says that um, um, they will be blessed, uh, um, they are blessed in, by God, they, um, God finds them blessed, blessed, their names will be blessed, uh, um, and the one is Mary, the mother of Jesus, um, she will be blessed uh, amongst people and blessed by, you know, and, and the other one is Jael, I'm not, I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing it, it's J-A-E-L, and Jael is an, is an amazing woman of the Old Testament, and, and, and I'll, I'll get into that story on another day, let me come back to, to this morning just speaking about disciples and I think um, you know God knows where I was and, and, and God I think deliberately steered me away from that great disciple Peter who, who I think all of us know and we all want to hear his story because it's what a profound, bold, exciting story that Peter brings us. But but God specifically kept Peter back and, and I, I have a sense of where God is going with that. And, and so if you want to know where Peter fits into the story on a Sunday, you need to keep on watching for you to find out because one Sunday morning, bang, Peter's going to be there and he's going to, he's going to change how we see ourselves as the Church of Christ. But this morning, I, I want to speak to you in, into this call of discipleship and, 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 and discipleship and, and I'm going to reflect a bit on a guy who in the story of Luke 18 would seem to be the ideal fit for what it would mean to be a disciple of Jesus. And I'm, I'm, I'm just, I was so, I was so, like, I was busy trying to find, I was actually going to speak about James, um, the, the, the disciple James, not James, our youth pastor. I mean, James, our youth pastor, I would have, um, I would have been, wouldn't have had enough time to preach into his life, you know. But, 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 but in actual fact, it, I was just like, as I was preparing this, God just took me to, to this story. And, uh, you know, it, it, it would seem that, that, <laughs> That, that this guy, um, that this, this guy who's in the story, that, that you would see, it would seem that, that he's the ideal fit for what it would be, um, uh, what, you know, what we would need to have in order to be a disciple of Jesus. Uh, it would seem that according to his observance of all things that, that were religious, that this guy was way more of a disciple than what the other crowd that had gathered around Jesus were. And, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll get into that a bit later. And on top of it all, he, he was a little, he was rich, and, and the one, uh, the one gospel says that he, he was a ruler. And, and bam, right there, what a combination um, to have authority, wealth. The, the, you know, to, to understand the religious um, observances and what I needed to do. What, 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 a, what a combination to be a disciple. And there should be no stopping us if we, we've got the money to do it, we've got the power and authority in our hands, and we understand the Word of God, and we, we, we've struggled, and, we, and we're on this journey. That would seem, that would seem to be the ideal fit for a disciple. That would seem to be the way discipleship works, and we have it all together. But that's not how it works, and we know that. 
We know that God calls through Jesus, God calls um, you know, the, 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 those that, that are less and, and, and not, not more, those that are the second string and, and, and the hangers on, those that didn't make the cut, who didn't pass the grade, who, who weren't the best of the best, and God calls them, Jesus calls them to come and follow him. But we come back to this disciple, this disciple that so nearly made it was so close yet so far. I think that's my theme for this morning in a sense. It's, it's so close yet so far. The, the, the guy that, that nearly made this, this call to discipleship, the, the follower that, that nearly took that step more and, and became a disciple of Jesus. So this rich young guy, you know who I'm talking about. He, he, he's not a follower of Jesus just yet, but, but he must have been some sort of follower of some rabbi at the very least. And, and because he, he knows he knows what it means to observe the Jewish law and he understands the commandments but but just on the side here, this story interrupted my reflections on the disciples with the thought the truth that what does it mean to be a disciple but well, what does it mean to be a disciple? not just of any rabbi not just of any teacher not just of any preacher or minister or doing etc no no a follower a disciple of jesus because i think in our churches today in our world today there are too many people who call themselves christians but are followers of people and not necessarily of the fullness of who god is they are not following jesus they're following men and they're following women and they're following denominations and they've missed Jesus in the midst of what they were called to follow. What does it mean, my brother? What does it mean, my sister, to follow Jesus into the truths of John 14? And we get to verse 6. And what does it mean to love with your all? After all, isn't that the first and, and the greatest commandment that God had given us? To love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. Doesn't Jesus, when he's questioned, doesn't he bring that out and put that on the table? The first commandment is to love your Lord your God with your everything, with your all. And this guy, this rich young ruler, I think, needs to interrupt our reflection on the disciples and refocus us on what it does it mean to follow Jesus. It's great to hear who they were. It's great to hear what they did. It's great to hear how God changed their lives. But what did they have to give up? What did they have to hold on to as the promise of the future by walking in the footsteps of their rabbi who they chose to follow, who was Jesus? See, my guess is that this rich young guy, this ruler, is sadly much more of a reflection of the followers of the disciples within the churches today than the disciples who ultimately chose to follow Jesus to the very edges of the earth and to the point of death, the death that awaited each and every one of them. If you want a warm and a fuzzy and an intellectual church, there are thousands around. They will tickle your ears and caress your fears. If you want a spirit anointed, all fall down, mass, emotional, heart kind of church, you'll find those as well. And there's thousands of them around and they will gather you in and they'll tempt you to follow through signs and through wonders. If you want a church that is biblical, even to a fault, you will find them as well. Places where the word has been followed with blind obedience and there's no actual impact, there's no reality in what they're, what, they're, what they're following. But if you want to find a blend and a mix of all of the above, you want to find the spirit and you want to find truth and teachings and you want to find Jesus and you want to find the word being unpacked, then, then, then I invite you to join me, to join us as we as a church, as Alberton Methodist Community Churches, we welcome Jesus into our midst and we allow Him through His Spirit to work in us and to change us and to revive us and to transform us into something that is beautiful to disciples of Jesus. I'm so tired of hearing men and women preach and preach and preach and lead people to follow them and they forget to follow Jesus. Friends, it's all about Jesus. It's all about God speaking new life and challenging new life and transforming our lives into the Jesus life, into the call to follow Him. So what is God saying? What is He saying to me and what is He saying to you? Perhaps this, this quote sums up this morning's challenge for me. This is the quote and I posted it on, on our Facebook page and it goes something like this. But you know it's so hard to reshape our lives to conform with the gospel. 
Uh -uh. It's so much easier to reshape the gospel to conform into our lives and into our lifestyles. In my opinion, which is going to invoke a whole lot of emotions in so many people, we tend to reshape the gospel. We tend to reshape the gospel. In fact, we live in a Christian culture that wants to reshape the gospel to conform with our lifestyles and our lives and our thoughts and our opinions. And I love Wesley, the, the founder of Methodism. I love that he sits in the midst of this all and, and this quote sort of just springs out from, from who he was. That he was busy reshaping the gospel for the people and for the church and for the denomination at the time. And God touches his heart and God warms his heart and God changes him. And, and he becomes a man who has this truth of, of, of reshaping men and women's hearts for the gospel. And he takes this out and he, and he reshapes history. He brings revival. You see, I think we as a denomination have lost that. And I think most denominations have lost that. And we need to refine it. And dare I say and dare I challenge you and myself. And I plead with you and I implore with you. And I say this, please let us find the heart of Jesus. And allow Jesus to, to call us so that we can reshape. So we can reshape ourselves, our hearts. To follow the faith journey of the gospel, of the good news, of the calling of Jesus. And let's stop reshaping the gospel to fit into our lifestyles and our cultures and our understandings. Doesn't the word of God say that his thoughts are, are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways? Doesn't the word of God call us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds? Doesn't the word of God call us to fix our eyes upon Jesus? who is the author and the perfecter of our faith story. What am I talking about? What am I talking about this morning? I'm inviting you to come on a journey with me. Let's, let's let Jesus speak to us this morning through His Spirit. Rem remember what John tells us in, in, in John 15 and verse 26, I think it is. John tells us that the Spirit that is given, the Spirit of truth, the counselor, will testify to us about Jesus. And so there's this rich young guy, this, this ruler, who came to Jesus asking, what must be done to inherit eternal life? I remember sitting uh, in church before service a couple of months ago, and Jason, our drummer boy, um, comes up to me just as I'm about to, we come and go on to, on, 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 to start service, to start worship, and he, and he sort of interrupts me at the door, and he says, hey, Jeff, have you ever thought about why it is that people are not so excited, don't get all sort of, um, you know, just amped and pumped up about eternity? That we, we get amped and pumped up about everything around us, but, but we sound of, we're not sort of all that, you know, there's... Like eternity just seems to be something we, we think about every now and again. And, and it's, it was such a profound question because that's ultimately what our faith is all about. It's about eternity. It's about eternal life. It's about where we're going to spend it. And this young man, this wrong, young ruler, this rich young guy, this rich young ruler, depending on, on which account you read, but this, this young guy, this rich, wealthy young guy, comes to Jesus. And this first question that he asks Jesus is this. He says, what do I have to do to inherit, to obtain eternal life? My first thought, my first question for us this morning is this. Do we follow Jesus for what we get out of Him here in the, in the now, for, for what we get out of Him today and perhaps tomorrow and next week and what we have around us? Or do we follow Jesus because we believe in this gift of eternal life that we will all one day inherit? You see, yes, it's okay to want a God who blesses us and who anoints us and who's appointed us to a life and a lifestyle of, of, of good things here on earth. But there must be more to it than that. That is where our, our faith needs to start in eternity, not end there. It wasn't the life of Jesus that sets him apart in, in many ways. It was his resurrection. It was the resurrection of Jesus that sets him apart and that sets us apart as a people of faith. And so it's a natural thing to hear this young man asking this question. But the question is, is it your natural question? Is it somewhere where you go? Is that what you want to ask Jesus? 
Is that what you want to ask him? Or, or do you want to ask him, well, listen, I'm, I'm struggling with my car, or I, I, I'm, I'm not happy with my home, or my job's out, or I've lost my job, or, or I, you know, I get all of those real things. But there's something more to this world and to this life than just the here and the now. And I love Jesus' response. I love Jesus' response, and, and, and I need to just say this. I, I love that he responds to the young man. I love that, he, that he's got something to say. He doesn't just look at the guy, but he responds. And I think we need to see this as a scripture lesson this morning. Before we get into Jesus' response, that's not about money. And I know this, this scripture and this little story is all about the money that Jesus, um, you, you know, about this rich young man, is all about the money aspect. But there's so much more to it than the money. But for me this morning, this riches the, of this story is, all, is, is an analogy, it's a metaphor for, 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 what, for what money, for what wealth is in our lives. You have to hear the story outside of the money. You have to hear the story in the context of true discipleship. It's in this that I believe riches captures those things that we value over absolute surrender to the call to follow Jesus. And so I'm going to read eventually for you from the Gospel of Luke. And I want to read from chapter 18 and I want to read from, from verse 18. And you know the story, so you all kind of know where I'm going. But I want to read it. I want us to get, get the understanding. Understand where this rich young Muda has not come and, and, and you know where we'll pick it up where we find ourselves. From Luke chapter 18. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Listen to these words. This, this, I love this. This is beautiful. And I don't know if you've ever picked this out before. Listen to the commandments. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All of these I've kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. I love that. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard is it for you, the rich, to enter the kingdom of God? Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, Who then can be saved? And Jesus replied, What is impossible with men is possible with God. And Peter said to him, We have left all we had to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus said to him, No one has left home or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come. Eternal life. There is so much deep truth in this passage of Scripture. So Jesus responds to this rich young guy, in order, in order to follow me, you must follow the commandments. And it's very interesting, isn't it, that between Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the accounts of this story, that Jesus names the last six, ten commandments. The commandments which have reference to how God expects us to live with each other. He doesn't touch on Jesus, doesn't touch on in that space, doesn't touch on the first four. The commandments about how we are called to worship and honor God before we live out this lifestyle here on earth. And yes, the young guy responds, all good, got that in the bag. I follow those six, no problems. I'm a religious follower of what it means to be a Jew. We are often guilty of following Jesus with a limited understanding of what it actually means to follow the commandments. Yet somehow we, we, we find ourselves in that space when we, we, we think that because we follow the, the last six that we've acknowledged the first four. Somehow, even though we, we, we know this, we, we find ourselves at some point in our, in our journey that, that we're missing something. We, we, we get that, that, that we're following and we, but there's something missing. And as we begin to explore the broader realities of our faith and we draw nearer and nearer to having a relationship with Jesus, we sense that there is a miss. We sense that something's not right. 
We sense that, yes, we, we're getting all this information and we're living out what it means to, to be a good, faithful Christian, but there's something missing. We sense the miss. There's something not right. The young guy knew this. Money hadn't fulfilled him. Power and authority had not met that emptiness. Nor had the sense of self-righteous religious practices met that emptiness. He knew that what he was observing was good, but somehow he had got to a point in his own life that he realized that there was something missing, something more needed to happen. And Jesus seemed to be the answer. Jesus seemed to be the answer. He had obviously heard about Jesus. Maybe he had even followed Jesus through a couple of towns and villages. He was rich. He had authority. He could afford to do that kind of stuff. And I wonder how many people in church buildings around the world are gathering around the Jesus story because they have heard the story, which is a great start, but they've heard the story that He may be the answer to their problems, to their stuff, and not the answer to the greatest question that we need to ask. What do I need to earn? What do I need to do to earn eternal life? Friends, the crux of the story could be in these next few words of Jesus as he speaks. A, a lot of I feel it's been everything already leading up to this point. And I think everything that, that's, that God has been speaking to us this morning is real and, and alive. But I think Jesus' response is real. And he responds again to this young man. And he says, if you want to be perfect or if you want to, uh, if you still lack this one thing and, and this one thing that you lack, go sell your possessions. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor. And then you will have treasure in heaven. And then... Come and follow me. We want to do it the other way around. We want to follow Jesus. And we want Jesus to convict us and convince us that we have to give stuff away. That we have to give to the poor. We wait for Jesus to tell us that, no, no, Jesus says, before you can follow me, you need to give it all away. Then you will have treasure in heaven. And then come and follow me. Ah, oh, I love this. I love, I love this, this, that we, we, we feel that, that we have to have it all together in order that Jesus says, you, you need to let go of everything in order to follow me. It's not about how great your bank account is. It's not about whether you've got a secure pension or whether you've got some investments before you get called into ministry. That's not how the call to ministry happens. Ministers, pastors need to hear this. This isn't about what you've got in the reserve so that you can go out and preach. It's about giving it all up so that you can go out and preach. So that you stand on the cusp of nothingness and you allow everything that is Jesus to lead you into this way that is going forward. This way of new life, of new hope and of new opportunity. Remember the test that, that, that Jesus has given with regards to the commandments and his reply? Remember, they ask him, so, so what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus' reply to that is this. The greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. You shall have no other God. You shall worship no other God. That's the greatest commandment. And in, in that sense, I get that what Jesus was kind of saying is that he turned those two commandments around when he spoke to this rich young ruler, when he spoke to this rich young guy, when he spoke to this guy. He said to him, you know what, are you following the commandment of love your neighbor as you love yourself? And the guy was, yes, I've got that right. I've ticked that box. And then Jesus says, yes, but in order to really, really follow me, you need to follow the first four commandments. You need to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. You need to give Him everything. You need to let go of what is holding you back and what you're holding on to. And you need to hold on to Jesus, hold on to God. In this story, riches seem to be this young man's issue. It was too hard for him to give it up. And the word says, he says this is too hard, and he walks away. This inability to see Jesus as more important, above and greater than any measure of wealth, caused this young guy to miss it, to walk away, to miss the promise of eternity with the Father, to miss receiving back a hundredfold, said the Gospel of Matthew in the story, that we would get back a hundredfold of all of that which we have given up. What is holding you back? What's holding you back? What are your riches this morning? 
As you approach Jesus and you tick the box about what you're doing right and, and I celebrate that in your life and, and I'm so thankful that you've got some of that right in your life but what have you missed? And what are you missing? And what are you holding on to? What's so important to you to trust that, to, to, that, that you can't let go and, and you can't trust God with it? Let it go. Give it over to God. To allow, those, to, to allow yourself to have the freedom of, of trusting completely in Jesus. What prevents you this morning from walking through the eye of the needle? What's making you this morning look like a camel? And are you prepared to admit that your religious observances up to this point may just be falling short of the call to follow Jesus? Jesus doesn't call you to go to a building to worship. Jesus calls you to follow Him. Because we are still holding on to our riches. We can never do that. And whatever they may be, yes, it could be money, but it could also be possessions and power and fears and relationships and biases. It could be a whole, a whole ton of stuff. What is, what is taking you away from that narrow pathway that leads to life? And it's leading you onto that broad road that leads to destruction. Are you ready to ask Jesus? Are you ready to get rid of your camel? Are you ready to let go of your stuff? Are you ready, church? Are you ready? This morning I have a camel. I'm going to call it Benjamin's camel. And I wonder whether we see ah, so small and it's cute and it's cuddly. The camel represents the comfort of who we are in the world. And then I have a made up needle. I can hold it here and you can hardly see it. And if I had a proper needle this morning, it would be so small that you wouldn't see it on the screen. But I made up, I made up a needle. Way bigger than what it really is. But even this needle that is way bigger than what the real needles are. And I take the camel and I look at the needle and I try and match them up. And I try and get this poor camel through that eye, through that space, through that eye. There is no ways. There is no ways I'm ever going to be able to do it. And if I do really try I'm going to damage this camel so much that it's going to be dead long before it gets to the middle. What Jesus is calling you and me to do this morning is He's calling us. He's calling us to get rid of the stuff. He's calling us to get rid of the, the, the things that make us look like camels. And He's calling us into a space where in pure faith we will let go of everything and we will allow ourselves to enter through the eye of the needle. And as we enter through that, the promise of Jesus is that He will give back to you that which you have given up for Him. That's the promise of Jesus. The promise of Jesus is, yes, in order to follow me, you must give it all up. You must die to self. You must pick up your cross daily. In order to follow Jesus, you've got to leave it all behind. You've got to leave it all behind. But His promise doesn't end there. His promise is, is that if you leave it all behind and you follow me and you trust in me, then I will give you back all that you need in abundance with more than you could ever deal with or have in your life. And so I'm not sure, church, where you find yourselves this morning. But before we can go on to speak about the disciples, to speak about their greatness and what they've done that impacts our lives, perhaps it's important that we once again just come back to a real space and acknowledge that too many of us are that rich, young guy. And that the wealth that we've surrounded ourselves with, whatever your wealth may be this morning, is holding us back from following Jesus. And until we can get up, get rid of, give up, give over to Jesus that which we put on to the camel, we will never be able to walk through the eye of the needle and walk into the gift and the glory and the promise that Jesus has 
for us. So may God bless you this morning. May God challenge you this morning. May God give you a moment this morning to think, just to take time and to reflect, to be honest, to be truthful with who you are and of where you find yourself. I don't know what your story is. I don't know what your song is. But I know what my story is. And I know what my song is. But I also know what my riches are. And I know what, I, what my camel looks like. The question is, do you know what your camel looks like? And are you ready to get rid of it? In Jesus' name. Jesus is mine, oh what a taste of glory divine, air of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, lost in His blood, this is my story, this is my song.